You're listening to Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. I'm Chance. I'm Sarah Catherine. We're a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week, here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals working to protect our planet and ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is a collaboration with the Sun Valley Forum in Sun Valley, Idaho, and was made possible through a generous donation by the Nancy P. and Richard K. Robbins Family Foundation. The Sun Valley Forum is an intergenerational meeting of forward-thinking professionals that come from a diverse range of disciplines. These experts are on the cutting edge of what's happening in the fight for our future, and they've all come together at the Sun Valley Forum to share ideas and collaborate on solutions for a greener tomorrow. Let's get to the show. Alrighty, guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We're very excited to be here in Idaho, Sun Valley, Idaho, for the Sun Valley Forum. And we're even more excited to be sitting down with Dr. Lee Recht, who is the Vice President of Sustainability at Aleph Farms. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So let's start off here with what is Ala Farms? What do they do? Go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, so Ala Farms is an Israeli company. We're a food company. And what we're doing is we're developing cultivated beef steaks. Um, so cultivated beef steaks are basically, are we're developing in the world of alternative proteins. We kind of divide it into two main categories. There's the meat alternatives, which could be plant-based, fermentation, algae-based, even insects, and they're basically analogs for the meat. And cultivated meat is actually more of an alternative to the production itself. So we take the building block, the same building block of, of a steak, which is the cell of a cattle, and from there we actually mimic the tissue regeneration that occurs naturally in the body of an, of an animal. Now we're doing it outside in a very controlled atmosphere, and that allows us to remove completely uh, antibiotics, significantly reduce the environmental impact of conventional beef production, and of course, no need in slaughtering animals or harming them. Yeah, and this, that's a really timely conversation because there's been this growing awareness over the last like 15 years of the, really the deep environmental impacts that beef farming has, you know, the from everything from the amount of water and grain and the water to grow the grain that goes into each pound of beef that's produced, as well as like the methane emissions, as well as the ethical questions behind sort of industrial cattle growth. Um, so this is a, a really interesting alternative answer to conventional cattle raising. Absolutely. So the way that I think Ala Farm was driven as we kind of were establishing the company for issues regarding climate and issues regarding food security and how to create resiliency within the food uh, systems in general and with the meat sector specifically. And that's something that's always been a big drive for us of how we need to look at how we can create food in a sustainable way, but that's, that's safe, that's quality, that's nutritional, but also that's still very much connected to the emotion and to the cultural and to the history that comes with, with food. I mean, that is kind of the idea that we want to support consumer behavior. I, I, we do still believe that actually there needs to be responsible consumption of food in general, right. also of beef and meat in general, but also of salts and sugars and, and processed foods as a whole. Yeah. But with that said, we also want to help and support consumers still enjoy that kind of experience of, of eating food. Right, because, I mean, food is such a huge part of culture, right? As much as music or artistic expression, the food, the way you cook it and the ingredients that you use to prepare it are, you know, woven into the fabric of every cultural identity. I mean, American as apple pie, right? Or you think of Fourth of July here in the United States, and that's like immediately you think of an outdoor barbecue with hot dogs and hamburgers, right? So this, it's really important when we're talking about this conversation of resilient food systems and sustainable food systems that we're not trying to rip away this cultural fabric because that's never going to be a solution that's adopted by a group of people if you're going directly against how they identify themselves, right? And also when you come to think about it, I mean, we can look at the world, we can map it out in different ways, but in the U.S. there's no um, 
there's no lack of protein intake, right? It's not that we're finding uh, alternative proteins. There, there are countries in the world that need more protein. Right. And that's a whole different issue, and we need to tackle that in a whole different way. But in the U.S. and in many other developed countries, there's actually overconsumption of protein. So I do agree that there needs to be responsible consumption, but I also agree that we need to find solutions about how we create our food in a more sustainable way. It's not about just, you know... All I need is more protein. It's about how I look at my diet and how I create it to be, become more sustainable as a holistic approach. And I think that's something that's really critical. And I think that's something that's very relevant for the U.S. market. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure it's not really an easy explanation, but I think it's kind of mystifying like how you have this like lab grown meat, basically. Like for me, just like, I'm like, what does the, does how many, like, how long does it take? I clearly have a lot of questions because I can't even put it in order. <laughs> so but first like... of all, first of all, we, we don't call it lab-grown meat. Okay. Okay. Just so you understand, almost every food product starts in the laboratory. I mean, absolutely everything, yogurt, ev anything that you can kind of imagine. We're defined as cultivated or maybe even cultured meat. And what we see as ourselves as another category within the meat. We're not trying to replace conventional beef production. We're not trying to be exactly like the beef. We're trying to show that there is a different category that we can create beef, just like you have red wine and white wine, kind of the same kind of idea. You can have conventional meat and you can have cultivated meat. And one of the actually, one of the big advantages of cultivated meat is how short our value chain is. So in conventional beef production, it can take anywhere between two to three years from farm to plate. And for us, it takes anywhere between three to four weeks. Wow. Wow. And that's a really, really significant uh, difference because when you look at a world where you have global pandemics, you have conflict, you have climate uh, events that are occurring, and you need to be continuously very flexible uh, with your market. And that is something that we really saw at COVID. And that's something that really is all about creating a resilient food system. I mean, the fact that you can really adapt quickly to big changes. So I'm not sure how much of the science you're able or willing to go into here, but can you talk to me a little bit about the process of how are the initial cells collected and what is the process of going from like a single cell all the way to a, a piece of cultivated meat? Sure. So basically what we do and at Ala Farms, we've built a cell bank. We take a sample from a living cow. We There is no need to harm it. And, uh, and this is something that's very important for us. We use natural cells, so we have no GMO cells and no immortalized cells. We don't manipulate genetically our cells. And then we, we've created this cell bank. And basically, I have to say that, till f that today we already have enough cells to feed the world. Wow. But we are actually continuously taking more, collecting more cells because we do want to connect closer to the local communities and really work with local supply chains as well. But... We collect the cells, and then what we do is, is now we're, like I said, we were, we're mimicking a process. So we are now putting it in a controlled environment, and we are feeding the cells directly. Instead of feeding the cow, we're feeding the cells. So basically, this we're mimicking the blood, and we do that with something that's called a growth medium. So it's basically a soup of nutrients, and it's full of sugars and amino acids and fatty acids and vitamins and and minerals and so on, and we're directly feeding these cells. And these cells, what there happens is these cells go through something that's called a proliferation, so they multiply. So that's the first process. So we do the cell bank, then we have the proliferation stage, and then what happens is we do a differentiation. The cells go through differentiation. That was going to be my next question because, like, the beef that you, you eat, it's not just muscle tissue, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and it would also and not tissue. exactly. It wouldn't be tasty if you would just eat muscle, right? It wouldn't be tasty. It wouldn't have a good texture. So when you look at a steak, when you vision a steak, you think about, of Marbling. course, muscle cells, but you think about blood cells, you think about fat cells, you think about um, fibers like that. You have that feel when you take that bite in a steak. Uh, so, yeah, so you have to differentiate these cells. And then after you do that differentiation, there's here is where the world divides into two different technologies. There is the printers, so the 3D bioprinters, where you can really like create a very specific structure. And another way, which is our first product, we also are working on a process with the bioprinter, but we're also the first product that we're coming out with is actually with the scaffold. 
So what we do is we put the cells on a scaffold and the scaffold is an edible plant-based scaffold and it mimics the extracellular matrix within the body. And the cells are actually, when you put them on there, they ad adhere together with the scaffold. Because that's what they would do in the body. Exactly. And that's how you create that full structure of a steak. And there you go. This is so fast. Literally, this could be a six-hour episode. <laughs> I'm not going to let it get that far. But uh, just the, the process behind it, because it is this, this combination of completely novel technologies of how we are able to deliver these nutrients and get the differentiation to happen. But it's also the exact same process that happens in every mammal everywhere across the, the, the globe and has been happening for hundreds of thousands of years, right? So it's the, the growth of the cells and how they attach the matrix. And I don't know, it's just this fascinating interface of what cells have been doing forever and this new technology to me. Well, the way I look at it is I think the world has understood that just looking at productivity without understanding externalities is needs to change, okay? And we need to see how we are creating our food in a way that's more sustainable. And cultivated meat is one solution. It's not the solution. It is one solution when we're looking at a full transition of the meat sector, so actually, the way we believe it and the way we're kind of approaching it is that we're not here to replace the meat sector. We're here to support the transition. So anyways, intensive livestock agriculture needs to transition to more sustainable ways of livestock agriculture. And actually, we're big believers of how critical and important and vital sustainable livestock agriculture is for the planet. But also, we are understanding that on one hand, there is a growing population of the world, global population is growing. There is a growing demand in meat. New markets are now demanding meat. And on the other hand, sustainable agriculture has a limit of its capacity of production. And that's exactly where cultivated meat can come in and supplement and support a sustainable livestock agriculture and focus the production and really reduce the pressure on the productivity so we can all focus on producing quality, safe, sustainable meat. And that's really like the way we approach it. So we really want to work alongside uh, sustainable livestock agriculture and not coming here to replace the farmers, the ranchers. Right. So right. So you're saying you're basically saying like this is not the end all be all solution. It takes lots of people, lots of companies, lots of things to create the solution. It takes everybody. It's an ecosystem. It's building an ecosystem. We need we need the meat sector with us. We need innovate, innovators with us. We need policymakers with us. We need consumers to understand what it is to be more responsible and more aware. And we see this. The younger generations are demanding it. And that's wonderful. I mean, that's what we need. But we also need, we need to support education. We need to think about a just transition because we are, just transition, it's not only about innovation. It's about generally we're transitioning to more climate friendly economies and we need to make sure that we're thinking about everybody involved even in the more traditional industries there's more than one i think 1.2 billion people worldwide rely on the livelihood of the meat sector two and a half billion people worldwide rely their livelihood on the agricultural systems you can't do these transitions without incorporating what will be with their livelihood and how are they part of this transition and we're absolutely very much focused on that as well yeah do you see a pushback from people who don't understand what you're doing or even from farmers who think like oh you're trying to replace what we're doing or do people seem to kind of understand it by now so consumer acceptance is, is going to be an issue, and it's always has been an issue. We're a novel food. We're a novel way of production. But we've actually really seen in the last few years, I mean, we're an emerging industry. We're new. We're not actually even yet in the market, right? So there is a lot of interest. I think we still need to continuously support and educate and show what who we are, what we are, what are what our intentions are on one hand. But we're also seeing that we're really showing that there is real impact in this kind of technology and this kind of way of producing food. And that's something that when we get down and sit with people and they learn for the first time what it means, then absolutely we see how that kind of, they, they can understand it. Another thing is, is that it is critical for us, the social impact of, you know, how we work together with the livestock farmers or with the ranchers or even with the feed 
farmers as well. I mean, with the whole with the whole value chain. And I think that is something that is a bit unique because, you know, the just transition came after lessons learned from the energy sector. Okay, right. This was where everybody spoke about transitioning to renewable energy, but wasn't really calculating the social impact of it. And unfortunately, I don't think there's still enough corporation of social impact on other innovative technologies. I feel very privileged to work in a company that's really putting that in the core. So really looking and thinking to ourselves, you know, what, what we can do to become not only as a product itself be impactful, but as a company say, okay, we need to be accountable. So we are building our company on one hand as a net zero company. So we're going net zero by 2025 in our operations, scope wow. one and two, and throughout our supply chain by 2030. And we're thinking about a just transition. We're thinking about social equality and climate equality. And these are things that are really important for us. And we're thinking about there's and a lot and many more things as well, like oh, of course the finance around it. And this needs to be profitable. This needs to make sense. We don't want sustainability to be a burden. And I have to say, that's a really big challenge. I mean, we don't have enough frameworks to support early companies that are trying to build themselves from inception as sustainable and being supported. So there's almost a certain level, there is an advantage of having, creating yourself as a company with that is with a really bad baseline, and then you're being supported to reduce it. But if you want to build yourself from inception sustainable, Right now, there is nothing that exists out there to support yeah. us on that. And that's something that we're also working on, on changing that and making sure that, you know, there are frameworks and we're going to be that case study. But it's, it's always exciting. It's <laughs> always exciting to be the case study of like it's a completely... It's also a lot of anxiety. <laughs> well, yeah. But it's sure. also a lot of, of, a lot of excitement. No, Equal yeah, parts. absolutely. It's all about leadership and we're all about leadership. And we also want to show that. And we agree. We understand there's resistance. We understand that people are afraid of their livelihood. I understand completely where they're coming from. We've seen it in the energy sector. We've seen it in other sectors. So we're doing everything that we can possibly do to support and how we can actually build innovative business models where they incorporate or and they provide value to these different stakeholders. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to back up and talk a little bit about you personally and what was your journey to becoming the VP of sustainability. It feels like a very specific place to land for a VP of sustainability for an industry that is A, novel, and B, um, kind of sustainable to start with. So did you always know this was the direction you were headed in life or how did you get where you are today? I mean, looking back, I kind of think I always knew it, but I never knew how to articulate it because there was no VP or head of sustainability back in the day. So I started my career in academia. I went, I did a, a bachelor's degree in food technology. There was no food tech. It wasn't like a sector. Food, the food industry was, the, was defined a traditional industry. Uh, but it was fascinating to me studying food technology. And then I moved on to do my master's and my PhD in the biotechnology of microalgae. And actually, back in the day, the whole concept of my, at least my master's degree, was all about microalgae as a feedstock for renewable energy. So it was mm. all about learning about renewable energies and that sector as well. So, yes, I've been always touching these different sectors. So I started with... with at one point, very early on in, in my research, we kind of understood that microalgae as a feedstock for renewable energy doesn't have the right business model for it. But we did look at how we can implement the biotechnology of microalgae in different industries and in different ways of uh, uh, implementing it and giving it value, whether it's in the food industry and in cosmetics and medical and so on. And then I started working and then I got accepted to a fellowship and I worked as a scientific advisor at the Israeli Innovation Authority. And there I was focused on what was then defined the clean tech sector. So it was really I started kind of really understanding that technology and climate was something that was always really interesting for me. And we were really working on how technology can actually support uh, the Paris Agreement and how we can find ways to reduce greenhouse gases through the clean tech sector. But then also I understood that, and then and I continued on to focus on on supporting corporates and organizations in implementing innovation and sustainability within their organization, but with a lot of focus on technology. And then there was at one point, I think about four years ago, where I understood that the goal is not the technology. The goal is is creating a resilient and sustainable 
production or a value chain. And to do that, technology is a tool, but it's not, it's not the whole. Technology is one of the tools, but you need to look at a much more comprehensive approach. You need to think about different business models. You need to think about leadership in different ways. You need to support a mindset, a changing in your mindset and behavioral changes. And that's where I did, that's where I kind of really went to shift from leading more innovation to leading more sustainability in organizations. And I started as an advisor. So I was a consultant for a few organizations. I actually came to Auto Farms also as a consultant. Wow. But I fell in love with the company. They show, I mean, really, there's so much leadership in this company. I do feel very privileged. And, and eventually, I, I completely committed myself to Auto Farms. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's definitely a great story. And I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for someone listening. What types of things should they focus on if they wanted to be involved in this type of industry? I don't know if it would be going to school for a specific subject or doing internships or finding a good mentor, but if they wanted to be in this industry or a cutting edge industry in general... Do you have any recommendations of how they would get started? Well, I'll say this. I have a lot of recommendations. And yes, everything that you noted is important. Find a good mentor, go to school. I mean, this is all important. But I will say this. Sustainability is everywhere. There's nothing that you can't do that you can't implement sustainability within it. Yes, you can be a head of sustainability or work in a sustainability department at a company. But you can also work at just at any single part of the de any other department within the company and incorporate sustainability within it. So I don't think you need to look at it and say, if I want to create impact, I can only do it because I'm in sustainability. I can create impact in so many ways. I can create impact through marketing. I can create impact through partnerships. I can create impact through operations and through production lines and suppliers. I can create impact through business models and finance. There's so much impact that you can create through finance. So I feel like there is, if that is something in your core, you can do it with any job you're going to go into. You can create that impact and don't, don't kind of stay narrow-minded and thinking I need to be in a very specific job in a very specific sector to create that impact. Because there is, there's a real big hype and a buzz about saying the word impact. It's it's great on one hand, but it also kind of, it closes you down to thinking that, what does that mean? If I'm a teacher, I'm, do I not create impact? No, you create a tremendous amount of impact if you're a teacher. If I, if I do other jobs, and I mean, every job you can do, you can define that you're creating that impact. And I think that's something that's really important, understanding that you have, you have the, the, the capabilities of creating impact no matter what you're going to do, wherever you are. When I was in innovation, that's all I did. I knew that I was going to focus my innovation strategies on sustainability strategy. That was clear to me. And that's why I pushed the directions with every organization that I worked with. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case with everybody that works with innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, that's kind of a theme. If you've listened to the show for long enough, you're going to hear that over and over and over. And I, I just... I love the way you put it just now because of the immediacy, like where you are, whoever's listening to this, where you are right now, whatever your job is, whatever you spend your days doing, you can find ways to bend that art towards sustainability day in and day out. You don't have to be the sustainability officer of a company to be thinking, living, breathing sustainability. You can do it from wherever you are right now. So I, I really like the immediacy with which you, you brought that. To pivot a little bit here, it's a question that's kind of been on my mind since I met you and I knew that we were going to do this interview. Have you personally had the opportunity to eat the products that are coming out of your farms? So, yes. The, <laughs> the quick, she was going to make me wait for it and then she the was quick like, yeah. answer is yes. The, the longer answer is that cultivated meat is not yet in the market. It needs, it's a novel food. It needs to go through a regulation process. So when you actually taste our food, you have to sign a waiver. Uh, we are working with all regulation uh, agencies worldwide, also with the FDA and the USDA, also with the European Novel Foods, Israeli uh, government, uh, Singapore government, different, many, many different governments that are now creating these frameworks for a regulation process within uh, for cultivated meat. Uh, so we're absolutely working with that. Uh, there was a cultivated product, a chicken nugget that came out uh, in Singapore early 2021. It was a big milestone for the whole industry. 
And we're now continuing. So we are wow. expected to have a soft launch by, I would say, mid-2023. And we're now building our pilot production in Israel, and we're expecting to have a soft launch in 2023 as course aligned with regulation and we're actually kind of starting to build our uh our roadmap for for the u.s which hopefully will be there will be here in 2024 that's so awesome. fantastic to hear yeah that's honestly faster than i expected i mean i know you've been doing this longer than you know the couple of days you've met us for <laughs> so it's, it's i'm sure it's been a process but i'm glad to hear that it will hopefully be in the market relatively soon well, we're not going to be the first in the market, but we're not trying to be the first in the right. market either. Uh, we are trying to do it properly and think about everything in a more comprehensive way. But yeah, we're close. I mean, we're 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 an emerging industry, but we're getting closer to commercialization. It's very exciting. That's awesome. If somebody wanted to learn more about Aleph Farms specifically or the cultivated meat industry in general, where would you point them? I would point them to our website. We have a lot of really interesting information there. We have different blogs. We have a really interesting white paper that um, my my CEO and myself wrote together. There's a lot of information out there. Actually, there is the Good Food Institute. That's an organization that kind of collects a lot of promotes alternative proteins in general, then divides it to the plant-based and fermentation and cultivated meat, new harvest. So I think there's a lot of information out there. We're more than happy. Uh, we actually, Aleph Farms is built, I mean, we are headquartered in Israel. We are establishing an office in, in the U.S., uh, but uh, we actually built an, a visitor center because it's really important for us. The, uh, consumer education Show transparency is something that's really critical for us. So if anybody ever comes to Israel, you're more than welcome to shoot us an email through our website and we're happy to host you guys. That's super cool. So if you guys are listening to the show right now and you wanted to learn more about this whole industry and about this group specifically, scroll on down to the show notes. I've got a link right there to their website so you guys can go straight from this to learning more. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today and we cannot wait to see what you do in the future. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I think you are doing such a wonderful job. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners, so if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet, and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.